Welcome. Welcome to the Poetry Flash reading series. I'm Joyce Jenkins, Poetry Flash editor and director, coming to you from Poetry Flash in Berkeley, California. Today we are pleased to present a reading by Kathy Coleman and Sam Sachs. This reading is co-sponsored by Moe's Books in Berkeley. You can purchase the books at bookshop.org slash lists L-I-S-T-S slash poetry hyphen flash hyphen readings. Scroll down just a bit on that page and you will see all the books featured in this reading. The link is in the chat box as well. You are muted on entry. Please do not unmute yourselves during the reading. This reading is being recorded and will be posted on the Poetry Flash Facebook page and then on the Poetry Flash YouTube channel. After the reading, after the recording has stopped, we'll keep the Zoom on for a few minutes so those who are joining us live in person can ask a question or say hello. Please visit poetryflash.org to see reviews and news about upcoming events in California. To join our email list, go to poetryflash.org and scroll to Join our mailing list. Our first amazing poet is Kathy Coleman. Her new book of poems is Time Crunch. Patricia Smith, the great poet Patricia Smith, says, the textured and lyrically lush narratives in Time Crunch, deftly honed poems that titillate and resound long after their last lines, firmly establish Kathy Coleman as a fierce and formidable voice destined to be a stalwart presence in the contemporary canon. Her first collection, Borrowed Dress, won the 2001 Felix Pollock Prize for Poetry and immediately made it to the Los Angeles Times bestseller list. Her second collection is Beauty's Tattoo. Um, she has many honors, including a Browning Award for Poetry and uh, many others. She's also been a reviewer for the New York Times Book Review. Please send out uh, jazz hands and, and uh, warm vibes to Kathy Coleman. Thank you. Okay. So the first poem I'm going to read, first of all, before I read, I want to thank uh, Poetry Flash and Joyce Jenkins for setting up this reading for me and Sam Sachs. Um, it's just wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, my first poem that I'm going to read is has come out of a uh, kind of lifelong uh, insomnia. Uh, so it's called sleep. I wake suddenly from a small red sleep as if the darkness were oil rising up to my eyes. I'd give almost anything to go back, even dream the one about the lost wallet, the forgotten locker combination, teeth falling out, even the hanged woman, my double with her blue sash noose, her raggedy Ann dress, entombed in my bed, the sheets like marble in moonlight, my rebellious heart beats too fast. An adolescent fist dipped in red sealing wax. I can sleep late, I tell myself, because I have no children, only dust and the sly early morning furniture. I have no husband but the black mountain from whose shoulders I can see the river shining like tin. What kind of offering can I make to you, sleep? 
Haven't I given you more than I've given anyone? In my book, Time Crunch, um, there, there are a lot of poems about uh, artists, writers, actors, musicians who have influenced my life and my work. So I'm gonna read a couple of them. The first one is about Antonin Artaud, uh, who was a poet, playwright, actor in sort of the turn of the century and wrote a book called The Theater and Its Double, which is really fantastic. The last time I saw Antonin Artaud, I fell in love with your face, or maybe not your face, but the lack of delirium in your eyes in the film Napoleon. Your jaw is so beautiful, it should have been breaking news, or maybe not news, but something setting off bells, an alarm that portended the pitch of your lecture on the plague, which was not a lecture, but an enactment of someone coming down with the plague who made the theater not only find its double, but its cannibal, or maybe not its cannibal, but its voraciousness, like an undercurrent that pulled down Icarus and his burnt wings. You who as a teenager were stabbed in the back by a pimp in Paris for no reason, whose somnambulism woke other sleepers fumbling in their beds, or maybe not their beds, but their army cots, and then the sanitarium where you remembered you owned the twisted walking stick that belonged not only to Jesus and Lucifer, but to St. Patrick, and you tried to return it to Ireland where they, you were put in a straitjacket, or maybe not a straitjacket, but a closer fitting suit, a bespoke suit, or maybe a costume you'd wear for the rest of your life while you dragged the sun and litmus paper moon on stage, both visible in the same hour, or maybe not an hour, but an intermittent infinity found in the soft spot of your madness, your godless mouth full with scatological oaths and screams, the hissing of snakes and glossolalia after the camera flickered over your skin shimmering as you played Marat, or maybe not your skin, but a fiery field from which you can't escape, or maybe not escape, but enter the room where you died sitting at the foot of your bed, holding your shoe. The next poem is The Last Time I Saw Janis Joplin. Just say yes to drugs. Come on, take it for pain, insomnia, heartbreak. Take your pick with their I am sick, sick, and so very well, too well, washed down with Jack to molder or lodge in your liver. I'm X-ray vision, songs about knives and a Mexican opal on my finger with buoyancy before drowning, the salvation pulse technology that buzz buzz between utterances, console me chaos, make me feel good, yes. Without them, I'm Without them, I'm a bad translation of the Bhagavad Gita, a quantum cup of joe that stings like speed shot in your vein. A wound zip shut so tight, the blood root must suffer its unholy itch. If only I could disguise myself as summer. Never, never, never. It's hot gleaming boulevard stretched out like muscle men. Those roller coaster sunsets with their pawnbroker silvers and golds and half naked adolescent dawns.
Just say yes, take another little piece. Fondle the red oblong queen. Hum the oval blues, baby blues. The yellow, I'm so lonesome for you. My quarry, my ghost girl. This next poem is based on the story of uh, Lita and the Swan, where Zeus turns himself into a swan and rapes Lita. I also mentioned uh, Dr. Caligari's Cabinet, which is a German expressionist film uh, made in the 1920s, it's a silent film, a horror film. It's called, uh, the poem's called Lita, outside Bisbee, Arizona. Another unslept night, outside the cat claw trees, knife grass drawn from Dr. Caligari's cabinet. I'm bleached by moonlight. I cover myself with the autobiography of a frayed blanket, dissonant wind chimes mother's far away sea voice. Nothing works, so I go back to the bar where he still sits clutching his gold rush brew. Nothing between us except his salt breath. A large man, like a chunk of broken off mountain. And suddenly we're in the weeds. He wants me to be nothing, his nothing, just like my father did. He wants me like that, prime numbered and factored out, wearing infinity's clothes. He enters me, rutting his weight, pinning me as if gravity gave him an extra dose. I dig my nails into the hard winter of his back bite his leathery shoulder. Then he's gone as I lie under the neon sign, vacancy. I strip off to burrow into my bed, the stirred up dark like river dirt in a storm, rolling over and over, writhing with nearly visible snakes. When daybreak forces itself into my eyes, and I pull another feather from my mouth. Um, this next poem I wrote when I first started teaching and it's kind of a little instructional poem. It's called How To. The secret is to rise early. Listen to liturgical collisions in the jazz riffs. See how that square of sunlight foreshadows a bigger radiance in the day. Drink strong tea. Get up and sing a lively song or reenact Galileo's discovery of a heliocentric universe. Sorry, I meant Copernicus. Then peel hard boiled eggs that roll wildly around the plate, reminding you vaguely of dating. Slice the eggs so you're surprised by the gold coin yolk and how painterly they look on the blue fiesta wear next to the early girl tomato. Now you might begin to suspect that some duty needs to be discharged, phone calls made, bills paid, or perhaps a fresh elucidation of Oliver Wendell Holmes's aphorism, we will twist the cosmos till it squeaks. But re resist these mandates, just laugh like Republicans at welfare. Sit down at your desk, whack the pinata of childhood until something ugly flies out. If you can't find a subject, 
just stare out the window, wait for an image to announce itself or the mail carrier, whichever comes first, or use a phrase from another writer's poem to get going. For example, the secret is to rise early. The next poem is Body Politics. And if you think about it, the word free conjures voting and animals leaping back to the wild. And here, I put my head on your shoulder in the 1950s, even before I was born. And it's still there watching rebel without a cause, but we have a cause to be hyper aware. So if you're reading this, it's too late because the fair is closed and the unfair is open. The whole country alight with uncivil rights. And if you think about it, the word free also conjures fighters and couches on the curb and everyone doing a shaky dance with congas and even snakes fleeing from their charmers. And if he says he's a woman, he's a woman, and I'm a man. And if I say I'm a man, then he's still a woman. So bake the wedding cake with a lucky coin inside, drown the hall in purple hydrangeas until we eat, drink, and bypass the sale that says everything must go because scientists have taken the first ever photograph of light as both a wave and a particle, which explains so much about swimming and kissing and that old electricity that ignited between us when you passed the beer and our fingers got entangled forever. And all I can do is go to sleep to trucks striking their tires on, on the curb, which sounds like the percussion in Stravinsky's Rite of Spring and dream of the dot and the line, a kind of Morse code that says, I'm still alive, what about you? The next poem uh, takes its title from the German mathematician, Kurt Gödel's. That's his theory of incompleteness. And not, not surprisingly, it's called incompleteness theory. But I want to tell you about that evening, I was locked in the museum and smuggled food from the paintings. Cezanne's rotten apples, Magritte's huge apple. Rembrandt's overcooked potatoes. I want you to know how I almost fell in love with Degas' self-portrait, his eyes empty of dancers, but full of a fig's sweetness. I came to see your kind of place. We slow dance naked as in a low budget film, out of sync looping, blurred and blinded by too many lens flares, my ravenous silverfish lingerie peppered with holes. I want to tell you about the theory of incompleteness, that in any mathematical system, there was always a question in the language of that system that cannot be answered. Now, as I lie on the ink spattered linoleum, that limbs a map of the earth, my limbs search for the center of exactly what will hurt the most. Inside the aphatic zone becalmed, I feel my finger on the horse latitudes where sailors had to heave the great beautiful beasts overboard to save on weight and water. I want you to know you touched my riverbed hair in lost, wrung out dawn. And now I'm falling through winter's painted carapace 
and I see myself. I want myself without you everywhere, starving. I'm writing um, a series of poems called The Fear Circus. And this is one of the poems. So I find a lot, a lot of things scary in this world. Um, so I try, I'm trying to counteract it. The Fear Circus. I teeter on the tightrope between my mother's death and my father's last words. My mother flew up and came apart, all naked petals and pearly footed. Father fell down into the cow patch of black and white TV, the once virgin land pocked with bright noise. I miss them like the ring toss misses its rings, like a jar misses its pennies. Inside, both mudsick and gold unrequited. Inside, the empty jar is always there, counting to itself. Zero equals zero equals zero equals the Quetzal feathered serpent with his twin, Zalati the dog-headed God who guides the dead. It was not in my act to murder them, my parents, even though I remember screaming, I wish you were dead. And my father thought back, I wish you had never been born. Mother said, I wish you were always being born. It's difficult on the rope because it gives me the thrilling vertigo that comes before suicide. It's physics, like the ancient debate between the Big Bang and intelligent design. Time forgets about itself. Even though my mother's romance wants the strong man to catch me, I've always been my father's contortionist, able to make love to myself picking up dimes with my toes and throwing them into the open mouths of the crowd. This is an elegy uh, for my mom and it has an epigraph. It's called the moths. Mothers, mothers are people who hunt moths. <laughs> Not unsurprisingly. Flicking their paper wings, wings more hyaline than eyelids, than pages in a miniature Tibetan book of the dead. They can never get close enough driven mad by this false moon's proximity. They can't reach her heat. Just as I, not angered, anch anchored to anything, can never for even one blinding second touch again my mother, moth mother, my incandescent. This is not hunger or thirst. That lovely fix, she, the light, is their only way home from the closed specimen box of darkness. Mm. This next poem uh, is really inspired a lot by Sam Sachs's work. But initially, uh, Terrapin Magazine put out a call for an anthology on different aspects of poetry. And I responded with a poem that uses figurative language. And there were some 
limits. And so the poem had to use um, some kind of restriction in it at some point, an actual restriction. And it's called Warning. It doesn't matter if you're the God of the door to door or if time slows down as it gets closer to Earth's mass and you're in a lab trying to come up with the moisture brownie, or if you're waiting for the cut glass river to shatter so you have something to eat, and love like snow blindness afflicts you and says it will show you a bridge of limbs that you can cross, that you can virtually feel in this filthy November with your dime store necklace and house of corrections clothes, without ever learning to zigzag through a cocktail party or that Samoon means a hot poisonous wind in Arabic, or that he's left so many times you no longer believe in object permanence. And when you cried into his crow shined hair while the moon was just a holy wafer disappearing on the sky's tongue, you felt a coin in your gullet. And someone else's life flashed before your eyes as if you had been a flight risk or the dark clearing its throat or a night that came in like a drunk uncle imagining he's home for good or that you were frozen in the crosshairs of a tornado that would make you want to crawl back inside your mother who sits on the New York Public Library steps where it says, for your own safety, do not climb on the lions. Let's see what time I have left. Okay. I'm gonna read, this is the last poem I'm gonna read and it's called, The Last Time I Saw Rainer Maria Rilke. You go back there when you can, to the field struck bright as if born from fire. The rest of trees, grass, sky, still and cool as a finished puzzle, the secret self not yet ravaged. This is where you find him, but mostly you have lived like an eternal expatriate from the country of belonging. To put aside one's own name like a broken toy, there's a vertigo that passes for illumination, electromagnetic addiction. He never knew this, the bridal that keeps you from straying all the way to the errancy, flight, and the coming on of clouds, the clear air that should be your birthright. But after you lift your fingers from the most unmusical of keys, you know you need him more than ever. You go back there as soon as you can to the field where the rain ticks on the lucent grass like the strings pizzicato. Part of you wanting to stay, part of you called back to the reckless world. Remember the true earth with its messages you read through the soles of your feet when spring burgeoned there. And now things conspire to tell us nothing, half in shame, half in unspoken hope that we still might rescue them like the violin he heard from a window giving itself to someone. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Kathy. That was a beautiful reading. Thank you. Really, thank you so much. So thank you. Thank everyone for coming. <laughs> Our next reader, um, who I'm thrilled to, in to uh, introduce. And um, let's see. Sam Sachs. Sam Sachs's recent book of poems is Bury It. Kayemba Jess says, Bury It, Sam Sachs' urgent, thriving excavation of desire is lit with imagery and purpose that surprises and jolts at every turn. A vitalizing and necessary book of poems that dig hard and lift luminously. Barriette received the 2017 James Laughlin Award from the Academy of American Poets. The first collection, Madness, won the National Poetry Series. Not too shabby. A queer Jewish writer and educator, they are a two-time Bay Area Grand Slam champion and have received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts, Lambda Literary, the McDowell Colony, the Blue Mountain Center, and the Michener Center for Writers. Please, please welcome with our, with our jazz hands and hearts, Sam Sachs. Hey, thank you for that introduction. Um, can y'all hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, so glad I get to be unmuted to just speak for a moment about how spectacular that reading was, Kathy. Um, so honored to share this space with you. Those poems are so smart and haunting and sparsely beautiful. Um, I kind of just want to like spend the next half hour in quiet contemplation of them poems. Uh, and of course, I had read the read the book before it. Um, they, they they take on a different air in the air, you know. Uh, so glad to be doing this reading. Also, after like two years of preparing for it. <laughs> so, um, okay, wait. I so I didn't start my timer yet. I got to end in twenty eight minutes. So uh, okay, I wanted to start with a poem. Uh, I went out drinking last night, which has like not been my life for a while. Um, but, and I also got a new puppy. So I brought the dog and everyone was like excited and bought me drinks. Um, and so now I'm like doing unwell today. So I thought I'd read a, open with a poem about a hangover. Um, this is like, a, it was called New Year's Hangover. And it's after Hera Lindsay Bird. Like a hammer swung into antique champagne flutes. Like a family heirloom traded for a Twix. Like a red dictionary dropped from a replica famous bridge. Like a robe made out of skin that turns out is your skin and oops, you must wear it. Like the man who lives in your occipital lobe slowly whittles a sad stick and sighs. Like a head wrap made of crane flies like a framed section of your brain hanging in a museum, like a school of angry kids banging their forks and knives at once. Maybe that's all a bit much. All I'm trying to say is last night I drank attempting to celebrate the end of a terrible year in preparation for an even worse one. And despite the coming and current devastations, the private and public executions of the soul, the laws passed to unstitch eyes from cameras. Still, we managed to assemble some friends to drink clear liquor and eat factory chickens. And part of me loves it this morning, how this is a pain of my own making, this throb, a diamond lodged in the skull. Okay, so that's about drinking. Now that we've got that out of the way, I feel cleansed and able to <laughs> just uh, read some other poems. Um, mostly I'm gonna be reading from this book I've been working on for the past like five years. Um, and there's a book about pigs, um, both like the farm animal and like queerness and kashru law and police and policing, just sort of like the, the, the larger pig umbrella. Um, and most, and, and also I'm going to try to read a bunch of things I haven't read before. So I appreciate this space and this time to stretch out with this work. Um, there's a sequence that runs through the book called Pig Bottom Looking for 
insert word, um, which is like often a thing you'll see on Craigslist for somebody looking for like casual anonymous sex. Um, and so there's pig bottom looking for now and it's sort of a meditation on time and like the sort of out of placeness of uh, communicating and desire through these technologies, which I'm speaking to you through right now. All right, pig bottom looking for now. I take pills and pass out in front of cameras, wake to messages finding me unconscious. An overdose on a live streaming jerk off site would be an embarrassing way to go no matter who you are. They're so angry I'm gone. Don't like to see a body emptied of its spirit draws attention to their own body, I mean. Would rather watch pleasure stampede through a stranger on a screen like water through a hotel faucet. Watchers leak behind screens. I close my eyes only to open them on the same country. Open them on a man braying like a dial tone. A group of girls laughing in Tacoma. Messages asking, are you okay? Are you dying? You dead? Stay just like that. Don't move. Don't make a sound. I close the computer. I go rinse my mouth. Okay, that's a sonnet. Um, okay, this isn't in the book, but it's also new and I haven't really read it out. Um, it's Quarantine Adieu. For those of us in California, which I think is many of us, we were in like the pandemic underneath like that blanket of smoke, um, which felt like multiple ends of the world. So this is a, a poem that sort of came out of that experience. I have a new app. Uh, no, I'm gonna start that again. All right, quarantine to do. A new app tells us whether it's safe to breathe. I haven't been outside in weeks. Afternoons sunbathe on the living room floor beneath the barred windows. It's grown sepia out there. A filter descends over the true face of the world. The little man on my phone's purple today wears a gas mask, recommends not riding a bicycle. I wipe ashes from my packages. My mail carrier Chris says it's the end of the fucking world. If anyone, he should know. Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night. Almost two and a half millennia ago, we split Brussels, broccoli, kale, collards, kohlrabi, all from the same wild cabbage. Such imaginations humans have. It's a miracle life existed here, long as it has. Okay. There's that, that one. Um, I had a, a sequence of poems in this upcoming book all about like, um, they're all in sort of responses to uh, complicated moments of like public gun violence. Um, and this is the one that survived in the collection. Uh, it's called After the Passover Synagogue Shooting, the congregants sing God Bless America off key. It's Passover even on this airplane where no angel could pass over us unseen. On my little screen, the killer charges cultural Marxism. Marx, I read, grew up in a split Jewish Goetia home, would sneak away over Passover to eat roast pork with his other half, my kind of Jew. This time of year, the Chabad men will ask, are you Jewish, ready to outfit wrists and foreheads in leather? And me, always too busy, will say no. Who isn't split? God bless America, they sing, discordant and corrosive through the white buds breaking up the complimentary Wi-Fi. My sweet, sweet home, my whole, my gaping, my almost. On this, the anniversary of my people's flight from bondage. On this, the anniversary of Mark's eating pork. On this flight home, I salt water from the dry flat stones in my face, watching the news of one woman dead. And the child next to me doesn't hear the police that will be stationed outside the synagogue from now on, but only a sad man traveling alone, America passing below us. I text S. I think all violence is just people trying to provide for their children. And she asks, really? Do you really think that? All right, Passover Synagogue shooting. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm, I haven't read this one out loud. This is predominantly made up of um, headlines that I collected over the past 
several years uh, that involved pigs. Um, and there are like two or three moments where that's not the case, which you will probably hear. Uh, but it is called headlines. And there's an epigraph from some pig, which goes, uh, literature is news that stays. In an Iowa pork plant, managers bet on how many workers will get the new illness. In Taipei, thousands take to the streets to protest US pork imports. In Missouri, residents worry the new pig farm will damage public lands. In 2030, plant-based pork sales are predicted to surge. In Iowa, new research examines the speed of pneumonia. In Cape Cod, authorities declare dead pig not killed in skater gang ritual. In order to prepare the head for consumption, you must first boil it into a thick jelly. In some cases, the pandemic spurs auto automation at the abattoirs. Infertile pigs are put down according to an algorithm. In the year I was born, the pork industry coined the slogan, quote, the other white meat. In the year my family immigrated. In Illinois, a barn fire kills 10,000. In the film, the prom queen responds poorly to the pig blood. In a tweet thread, the man asks, how do I kill 30 to 50 feral hogs? Dot, dot, dot. In the Financial Times, bull market run in lean hog futures still strong. We must, quote, save the pig from its association with police. In the 1800s, thousands of pigs roamed the wild streets of Manhattan. In 2019, I do the same, wild turkey in my pocket, deciding whether to dive into traffic. 1969, the Yippies run Pegasus for president. In Santa Rosa, pig blood is smeared on the defense witness's door. In my body, I do my best to record plainly the facts of the day. In an Iowa pork plant, seven are fired for betting on how many workers will get sick. In an Iowa pork plant, over 1,000 people contract the illness. At least seven are dead. In a small city east of here, wild pigs have overtaken the police station. And in some better future, more pigs will come to do the same. All right, first, first run of that one. Thanks for being its inaugural digital audience. Um, yeah, okay, this is, this is another one from that project. Uh, it's called Hog Lagoon, which are like um, these uh, ditches in like surrounding pork uh, or like pig factories where pigs are farmed, where they like all of the pig fecal waste is stored. Yeah. So it's about those. You can smell it soon as you enter the state. Caught from space, the pools look like wounds in the earth. Cut precise and surgically pink. Hundreds of millions live and die inside the factory. Excretion falls through the slats and slides into pits. Stored in the open to later be sprayed onto crops which are fed to the children of pigs pink viscous circle. Some human residents mistake the spray for rain. Some human children open their mouths to catch faith on their tongues. The rain makes its way into homes, even with the windows closed, makes its way into rivers and lakes. What happens inside the factory can never stay inside the factory, no matter what the farm believes it pays no matter the assurance of compromised scientists, no matter how thick the walls, we all eat shit. Everything that happens on earth happens everywhere. It comes up in us as fungus. We won't taste until we're dead. All right, hog lagoons. Um, yeah, it's, it's odd to do like these online readings because I feel like so much of how I eat the time between poems is to like interact with people. But now I'm just like staring at some silent folks. Hi, thank you for being here. So special. Um, yeah, okay, I'll read another new one from the book that uh, isn't, I don't know if it's done, but um, uh, this event, the, the bookstore that is like, I guess handling our, our books which graciously is Mo's books who I worked, where I worked during the pandemic for nine months. Um, and one sort of weird part of that job was occasionally going to like people's homes who had either moved or died or the relatives of people who had died to collect their libraries. Um, yeah, and a lot of folks were dying during the pandemic. So this is one I wrote after a particular, uh, a particular 
whatever trip to go to go to someone's someone's home. Um, it's called this is called warfare is not caused by pig love. That's a poem. It's italicized. Warfare is not caused by pig love was underlined in the book I opened cleaning out the man's apartment who just last week killed himself overdosing on sugar. It was my job to take his life from the home he'd made for a quarter century down to the truck we'd drive 10 minutes to the dollar store and then to the dump. When you die, even if someone comes to cart away your books, we take our libraries with us. All day I box up fantasy and atlases, science fictions and dictionaries with ruined spines. All day I gather pressed wildflowers and stack them neatly into new houses. In another book, I find the word paradise floating alone in its margins. Sugar may not be the worst way to leave. In the end, all I want is whoever is paid to box up what I've read, to nod their head and if not respect, at least comprehension. All right, warfare is not caused by pig love. Um, I bought, I brought, I could take like a bunch of his books home with me. And so I've got like a whole shelf of these like really strange books. Um, he was a pro prolific science fiction reader and I got to find some really old strange texts uh, that were just gonna get thrown out. But me and my partner have slowly been reading through them. Um, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll pivot. You know, this, is, this isn't like a pig specific poem. <laughs> Maybe it's getting a little pig heavy up in here, but um, yeah, I'll pivot to this new this new poem I wrote for a friend who was making an, an anthology of like addiction poems. Like um, for a minute, for like three years, I was uh, sober and identified as like an addict, and then I started drinking again. And this is like this a palinode that's trying to like understand recovery and the sort of like complicated journey. Um, that like our language, how our language maps our identity and how we think of ourselves in relationship to like illness and desire and all that stuff. So this is Palinode. It's not that I don't not have a problem, nor is it my problem is it not me. Neither is there anything in the meat that denies us all this theater. But here in the keloid, I remember what pride I took in those three years I believed in control and in substance. Then I was a lady out amidst teething. In the bar's crooked dentistry, I'd sip still water and become greater than any man pulling fishes from stone. There beside the other dying parishioners, I was perfected, sober as a judge in his grave, haunting the bars like a spirit as evenings dragged open their pupils in the dark. I'd let any man talk dirty, but none take me home, knowing we'd wake different in the same bed. Who am I now? I've returned to the well, unwell. How sad and predictable it was a man who brought me. After three years, I let him offer an exit wound and climb greedy through the soft tissue, grateful to have again found someone else to blame. For a time, addict was my name, fit like an orange life jacket. Now it's gone, I am gone. And who the hell is this new self? that's come to fill in my absence. Yes. Okay. This one, this one, all right, this poem was uh, published in the uh, JVP Hagata, which I think, or in the Seattle JVP, Jewish Voices for Peace Hagata, which was like my favorite publication um, that I've had, like credit. Um, and I wrote it just after the uh, capital of Israel was moved to Jerusalem by our last president. It's called Everyone's an Expert at Something. The more I learn, the more I learn, I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> to someone who doesn't care a fig for poetry, they'd likely think I knew a lot. Yet in most bookshops, I'm lost. Shelves heavy with the bodies of forgotten writers. A president can say audacity or a president can say sad and both eat the same cured meat of empire. When I say I carry my people inside me, I don't mean a country. The star that hangs from my neck is simply a way of saying Israel is not a physical place, 
but can be written down and carried anywhere. It says my people are most beautiful when movement, when moving, when our only state is the liquid state of water is adapting to our container. Homeland sometimes just means what books you've read, what stories you spread with your sneakers. My people, any place you live long enough to build bombs is a place you've lived too long. It's relative, my friends, the only thing I know for sure is the missiles on television are only beautiful if you've never known suffering. My friends, the only country I will ever pledge my allegiance to is your music, is under investigation for treason. So that's, everyone's an expert at something. It, it also appeared somewhere else, but I think the, the, the JVP Haggadah was the real piece of the resistance. Um, all right, so I might read a couple older things now that I've, I mean, I've got what, like nine minutes left. This still, we, we still good for whose faces I can see, We're okay? Yeah, all right. So, all right, this poem is from, uh, from my last book, uh, it's called Barry. Um, I did like months worth of research on uh, various uh, like cultural burial rituals that ended up just being like two lines in the whole book that are in this poem. <laughs> yeah. All right. I'm interested in death rituals. Maybe that's a weird thing to say. When I say interested, I mean I've compiled a list. On it are mourning practices gathered across time and continents. It's long and oddly comforting how no one knows a damn thing about what follows. I won't share it with you, only say, evidence suggests Neanderthals were the first hominids to bury their dead. Also, I'll say they didn't possess written language, which points toward internment as a form of document. The body is ink in the earth. The grave marker, a gathering together of text. The first written languages were pictorial and marked the movement of goods between people. I don't know what to do with that, but pretend death's a similar kind of commerce, face stamped into a coin, what's left of the body in the belly of a bird, two lines that meet to make a man alive again on paper. I know, I know, ashes to ashes and all that dust to irreverent dust. I know everyone I love who's dead did not actually become the poem I wrote about them. Their breath, a caught, fathered object thrashing in the white space between letters. Contrary to popular belief, uh, elephants don't actually bury their dead, lacking the necessary shovels and opposable thumbs. Rather, they are known to throw leaves and dirt upon the deceased, and this, too, is a kind of language. When I'm gone, Make me again from my hair. Carry me with you, a small book in your pocket. Yeah. Oh. It's fun. I haven't read out of this book in so long. Maybe I'll do one more. Let us see. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is a weird one to do. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll do this one and then pivot back to some new stuff. Uh, this is about getting calls for SDI tests, <laughs> uh, which has been a minute. So this feels very nostalgic to me. Um, all right. Let's call it standards. And again, the test comes back negative for waterborne parasites, for gonorrhea of the throat and of elsewhere, for white blood cells in the stool. This isn't always true. Sometimes it's a phone call from your lover. Sometimes it's your computer blinking on with news of what's wrong with your body this time. Simple, really. How he says the name of disease and suddenly you're on your back, staring out the window onto a highway. And suddenly a woman enters the room to wrap a black cuff around your arm and squeeze until you're no longer sick. To slip a device under your tongue, check if your sweat's accompanied by the heat it demanded. And aren't we all of elsewhere sometimes? the nowhere places you make yourself inside the hallowed chambers of the hospital and inside the man's unsure voice when he calls and is too scared to name the precise strain of letters you might share now. What parasite might feed on the topsoil? What laugh track? What tabernacle unlatched to let all that God in? What bacteria spreading its legs in your throat as you speak? When the illness is terminal, 
you drink an eighth of paint thinner while all the color drains from your face. All those little rocks in your gut turn to buses, all those buses full of strange men, each one degree apart, all going somewhere and gone. Funny how a word can do that, garage the body. What if instead he'd simply called to say epithalamium or new car or sorry? All right, that poem. So let me, I'm gonna try to do, oh, I got five minutes left. I'm gonna do two poems. How was, I don't know how time works. That might not be enough. Maybe I'll do one poem. Yes, one more poem. Um, and beforehand, I will say uh, thank y'all for coming this afternoon on this fine Sunday. Um, Kathy, it's such an honor to read with you. Thank you, Poetry uh, Flash, for making this happen. Uh, and Mo's books, we're carrying some books. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the last one. This is from the Pig Book. Uh, a friend of mine had Marfans and got, or has Marfans and got uh, part of his heart replaced with a part of a pig's heart which is a process called xenotransplantation. Maybe y'all know someone or have yourself a bit of a pig in you. Um, and yeah, I wrote this poem for him called Xenotransplantation. My friend's got a pig heart in him. Or my friend's got part of a pig's heart, a piece. His heart's part pig. The aortic valve is the dog god guarding the tube blood runs through once it's been scrubbed clean one of two semi-lunar valves, which sound like a part of a moon, a piece. My friend's got moons in him, separating the two major atria. My friend's full of ballrooms, all those dark vaulted ceilings. My friend's a vegan. <laughs> My friend's a vegan with a pig heart, thumping club music. My friend believes the pig in him is vegan too, since it eats when he eats speaks when he speaks. The pig heart pulses in his chest like a reflection of the moon in a puddle out behind the club once we finished dancing. My friend takes drugs so his body doesn't reject the organ. My friend takes drugs so he can go on dancing. His pig, grown to be sewn into a man's ribs, unnaturally selected. No god could have predicted this in any garden still holy the bit of tissue that lets him live and live, thin filament that set another 17 years going inside him. If you listen close with one ear to his chest, you can hear the pig heart calling out to any listening animal, singing, all I want is to live and live and live and live. Cool. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. What a what a great reading. Sam Sachs and Kathy Coleman, thank you. And thanks to each and every one of you who logged on today. We really appreciate it. And um, to whoever may see this in the future on YouTube. And um, Please check out these books. You will not regret it. Please check out these books. Um, like I said, bookshop.org slash lists, L-I-S-T-S slash poetry hyphen flash hyphen readings. And it's in the chat box, the link. And if you lose it all together, go to the reading write-up on poetryflash.org or um, go to the to the event page for this reading on the Poetry Flash Facebook page and you will see the link in the description of the reading. And um, just thank you so much. So see you, have a wonderful rest of your day.